Not too long ago, I started playing a rather fun indie game called Bro Force. It's a chaotic and bombastic game where every character is a facsimile of some action star. Ram Bro, the Brominator, Bro Hard, you get the idea. The game is very clearly tongue-in-cheek, playing up the insane violence of these characters' sources and the folly of civilians caught in the crossfire. The developers are very self-aware of the toxic masculinity and reckless killing their characters engage in, and that's more or less the joke. What stuck out to me most was the game's ending, where the host of characters shake the hand of the president before greeting a crowd of adoring civilians as their country honors them. And this is clearly, again, intentionally facetious, because most of the action heroes, the Bro Force Lampoons, would never shake the hand of the president or accept a government honor. Rather, this ending seemed to closely resemble the ceremonies rewarded to our modern-day action movie heroes, most consistently superheroes. While the 20th century looked up to Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and Kurt Russell in the over-the-top exploits of popcorn action movies, the blockbusters of today are dominated by the newly prominent superhero genre, most notably spearheaded by Marvel Studios. I don't think I need to school anyone on the sheer success of the Marvel movies in particular, with Avengers Endgame dethroning James Cameron's Avatar as the highest grossing film of all time in 2019. Despite filling a similar role of entertaining the masses by blowing up bad guys at increasing collateral costs, the more I observed both parties, the more I found that there's a great deal that divides modern superhero movies with classic action films, to the point that their parallelism is almost baffling to me, and to properly explore that, we should start with exploring the character who is arguably the template for the classic action here hero, John Rambo. First Blood was released five years after the end of the Vietnam War, the American military exploit to which the American public and military personnel was arguably wisest to their own exploitation at the hands of their leaders, with protests focused heavily on the deployment of young soldiers, an endeavor largely pinned to the acting president, Lyndon B. Johnston. Veterans returning to the states at the end of the war were often subject to miserable lives as rampant homelessness, PTSD, long-term health issues caused by their opposition's chemical weapons weapons, and the discrimination and scrutiny of the people of the very country they aim to protect ravaged them. All these trials were the reality of many veterans in real life, as well as the character John Rambo, who can't even seek out a decent meal in a small Washington town without being harassed by the territory's tyrannical chief of police, who fears a potentially dangerous man of combat would disturb the village's peace. Rambo's fight wasn't against terrorists or career criminals, but the law enforcement that would act against him with prejudice prejudice because of cruel stigmas surrounding those of his vocation. And in ways big and small, this would continue to be a theme in action movies in the adjacent era of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, be it in ways that strongly drive the plot, such as the government deceptively sending an android alongside the crew an alien, or blackmailing Snake Plissken in Escape from New York to figures of power impacting characters in small but oppressive ways, such as the scrutiny Dirty Harry is placed under when he unlawfully shot a man to save a woman from being raped, or the opposition of romantic interest John McClane faces in Die Hard in the form of a privileged conservative yuppie type. Characters themselves may have grown more bombastic and out of this world, but their animosity towards establishment for exploiting them, taking over their world, or even just making their job hard remained consistent. And people in this time period needed stories like these because they only had their superiors and the government to blame for the tattered state the U.S. was left in after the Vietnam War, where several forlorn soldiers were simply left to scavenge for themselves in the disastrous fallout of a mutually destructive conflict. In that regard, the superpower of these old-style action heroes was independence. These characters usually experienced grievous loss before their final battle, be it their entire squad or closest friends, but these blows were always overcome by the sheer will of the protagonist, who would miraculously take down legions of henchmen before taking down their nemesis in an act that would not only avenge their friends, but free themselves of their oppressor. This was all the great dream of the working person who felt victimized and oppressed by their superiors. I feel this is illustrated in no way better than the climax of Robocop, where the titular character is freed of his protocol forbidding him to kill the malevolent president of the company that created him, exacting brutal justice and referring to himself by his true name, Murphy, separating his human and corporal identities in a way many dream of but never could. 
an oppressor who often and arguably created these heroes, and because of that, Ty felt invincible, controlling, and downright untouchable, were what made action heroes resonate in the 80s more than any other era. The dream that someone could take control of the situation and break whatever rules that shackle them to their horrid circumstances was one many needed. And while these are easy characters to root for from the seat of an audience, these characters in-universe are maligned and outcast for their countercultural endeavors. More often than not, the job of an action hero is a thankless one, with the characters in question feared and detested by their peers. The struggles of mental health these characters find themselves subject to are rarely made light of, but when heroes such as these fought to take control of their independence and avenge dead friends, they have little reason to resist this disposition. This was the norm for action movies for a long time, but as time went on, the genre devolved into something of a joke. As unexplored avenues became lesser and lesser, creators focused on the spectacle factor of action films. As characters such as Rambo and Dirty Harry lost the harrowing meanings of their identities in a wake of deluges of sequels and reimaginings, people were growing tired of the traditional action hero. But there was one external factor that would be the final pusher to put hiatus to the heyday of these characters. The September 11th terrorist attacks. The attack on the Twin Towers turned the entire world upside down, especially for people in the United States as fear of terror skyrocketed and the American people were exposed to protocol, uncertainty, intolerance, and nationalism, just as unprecedented and sudden as the attack itself, which is why audiences flocked to a film that would release less than a year later that would breathe new life into the superhero franchise. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Spider-Man was following the coattails of X-Men two years earlier, but it came at exactly the right time when people needed him. Chief among Spider-Man's characteristics are his roots in the city of New York, the city that was host to the terror attacks that shook the nation. Spider-Man inspired the ideal that not only could any average Joe be a hero, but that his hometown could stand together against any threat, representing the pride of New York who inspires those around him. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. The idea of superheroes was also helped by the common trope of them wearing masks, bolstering the fantasy that anyone could be the hero beneath the visage of Spider-Man and the like. The unity of the everyman in great numbers was a hope people needed at a time like this. While the Vietnam War left people friendless, jobless, and without hope in anyone but themselves, the September 11th attacks instilled a need in one another to hold people close for fear of losing them and to stand together under the tremendous burden of this constant fear. Superhero movies in the early 2000s were often team-oriented with this in mind, with both X-Men and Spider-Man turning out respectively performing trilogies, but the paradigm would take another massive shake in 2008 with the monumental release of Iron Man. It's often alleged that Stan Lee created the character of Tony Stark on the external premise of making a superhero based around an unlikable character. And if this is true, then the task was absolutely accomplished. Tony Stark is an affluent weapons dealer who, in this particular context, can easily be connected to the DNA of the antagonists of classic action films before him. Iron Man was the authority and power that lone wolves of these classics opposed. He would, in another life, be the executive who creates and exploits Robocop, the yuppie investor who would sell John McClane out to Hans Gruber in pursuit of his rival's wife, and the futurist who would send an interloping robot onto the unwitting space voyage of Ellen Ripley. Tony Stark's story is that of a war profiteer being exposed to the fruits of his endeavors firsthand, putting him through a humbling and traumatizing experience that inspires him to turn over a new leaf, rising from the ashes as Iron Man. Iron Man didn't gross as much as its then peers in the superhero genre, but its legacy long outlasted them, kickstarting the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which would go on to change the landscape of film for the foreseeable future, leading to the monumental release of The Avengers. What was interesting about The Avengers, though, is the fact that it was somewhat famously denied funding from the U.S. military, deemed not realistic enough a depiction by the Pentagon to fund. This was a rather contentious exemption, one that excluded The Avengers from the same hand of help that benefited the likes of the Transformers trilogy, Man of Steel, and most relevantly, the first two Iron Man movies. From this, alongside the writing apparent on the wall, there's an ample, unflattering military depiction in the Marvel continuity, as they rarely save the day without help from superheroes and are usually shown as shady at best.
And yet we still have stories of Carol Danvers being more or less rewarded for her Air Force service with superpowers, a Spider-Man who proudly fights in the name of mass surveillance, and a veteran experience on part of Captain America that isn't easy but feels significantly cushier than the likes of John Rambo is treated to. Both the action films of old and the MCU display larger military forces as flawed, malevolent, and just as easy to manipulate as they are manipulated. But the real crux of all of this doesn't lie in those huge elements, but in the heroes themselves, as it's their stories we follow. You may notice that a huge tie between action heroes and superheroes is their background usually in some kind of service, often military or police, if not some other kind of public service, and how their careers in the universe as heroes often circle back to serving the same vocation simply on their terms. These are characters who carry out their duties, but often on their own rules. As a result, just about all of these characters can be analogs of some level of real-life veteran, soldier, or service member. Where these characters diverge, however, is in the public reaction to them in-universe, as I've gone into great detail as to how action heroes are manipulated, cast out, and maligned in-universe. There's a sense of celebrity within the MCU heroes are treated with. Despite taking means into their very dangerous hands, they're treated to military honors, positions as publicized role models, and televised celebrations. There are points in these character stories where the heroes fall under public scrutiny, but these are often hurdles to overcome, rather than permanent realities, as Iron Man and Captain America can clean their reputations with further, greater heroics, contrary to how characters adjacent to Sarah Connor and Snake Plissken perform heroics despite knowing there will be no such prize for them. This provoked some thought that made me remember that this wasn't the norm for superheroes necessarily. It wasn't any surprise that in the 80s and 90s, the most popular superheroes were the gritty and lawless likes of Wolverine and Punisher, characters who fought no matter what anyone else thought, and just like the action heroes they shared limelight with at the time. But you don't even need to look at anyone operating on that level of ambivalence when a perfect example exists in Spider-Man. Spider-Man, as we knew him before the MCU, was closer to any action hero than you'd believe. Despite being a paragon of honesty and integrity, Spider-Man is a vigilante for all intents and purposes. He has the best of intentions, but the public doesn't see that. People Peter Parker talks to every day call Spider-Man a menace and public enemy. But Peter carries on his battle because he is aware of the net positive his methods beget. Compare that to the Spider-Man we know in the MCU as a near-Jesus figure who gained the adoration of the public when he nobly sacrificed himself in Infinity War, whereas the reality for older adaptions of Spider-Man were that his sacrifices were daily and still underappreciated. The true mark of a hero isn't the accolades they gain or medals they wear, but the fact that they do the right thing no matter what anyone says. Not everyone will take pride in their work or recognize the lives they save, but that's not why they do it. Superheroes do what they do to be the hero they didn't have and needed to this day. This isn't to say either side of these stories is inherently right or wrong, but context starts to develop with the notion in mind that all of these characters are some level of veteran or elevated soldier. The MCU isn't pro military in how it depicts the explicit military, but how it shows honors and rewards awaiting characters who make sacrifices when this simply isn't the reality for the 50,000 homeless veterans in America today. The Purple Hearts and political careers we see lauded on TV simply aren't everyday stories for people who go into service. And in a similar sense, John Rambo was not forgiven for the same crimes Clint Barton committed. Carol Danvers' enlightenment and identity crisis was something she could fly into space away from, while Sarah Connor was tortured and committed. And Tony Stark had a massive and tearful farewell and nearly worshipping legacy that Snake Plissken could only dream of as the president tries to have him shot. And I don't think I need to tell you which of these situations awaits real-life veterans and which one citizens will seek out when they find themselves enlisted. Based on all of this, it might be easy to feel magnetically drawn to take a side in this matter, but even still there are shades of grey that blurry it, as what really kickstarted my train of thought of all this wasn't any desire to take any side of the matter down a peg, but a cracked article 
five common beliefs that make disasters worse, written recently in the relevant wake of the coronavirus pandemic, in which the rules and safety regulations surrounding the situation face a troubling opposition in those who would protest against the inconvenience these conditions cause and willingly place their wishes over the safety of others and the ideas that are put in place to regulate it, and the characters being emulated in any way that would enforce these dangerous actions closely resemble the rebellious and independent action heroes of the classic blockbuster era. The characters who lifted up the idea that it's the tough loner who creates their own rules, who winds up winning out and surviving an apocalyptic situation, when the reality is that something like this can best be endured by cooperation and unity often found in superhero works. The Avengers and other superheroes work in units. They can rarely pull off a victory alone. It's teamwork that's truly inspiring about these stories, the cooperation and give and take that comes with helping your neighbor and lifting up your friends against impossible odds. In a time where we feel powerless to change anything all by ourselves, it's the movement we inspire in others and unity in our ideas where we generate power, not by being a lone wolf, but by having someone's back and ensuring that someone has yours. That's a message we need now when public communication and social media is the platform with which we spread ideas and fight our battles. Classic action movies helped one feel powerful in a situation where they're alone, and superhero movies remind one what can be done with help. That is the power of both. Power sort of married by the presentation of Broforce. Here, the action hero characters, who are characteristically loners and stand offish anti heroes, unite and fight for a common cause. It's clearly a simplified and over exaggerated take on the characters for very intentional humor, but it's also a marriage of both eras' of blockbuster mentalities with that in mind. The power of standing alone and the security of a team's unbreakable bonds. Rather than take a side with one or the other, there's beauty in acknowledging them as necessary sides of the same coin, a yin and yang that must coexist because we'll need both at different points in our lives.